Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. If you haven't already done so, please mute yourself. My name's Marty Shepherd, and it's a pleasure to be here as a District 9820 Australian Rotary Health Chair. We're here to discuss the Lift the Lid campaign on mental illness in Australia, Rotary Health. It's our annual national fundraiser. The campaign found, founded by Australian Rotary Health past chairman, Greg Ross, started in 2016 in partnership with the Rotary Clubs of Victoria. The event was such a success that it's now extended to all Rotary Clubs across Australia. Many clubs celebrate this in different ways, often Mad Hatter, tea parties, high teas, etc. Each year, approximately one in five Australians will experience a mental health illness, and in order to help future generations of young Australians, we need to look ahead through research and find out how we can prevent this type of illness occurring. This year, Australian Rotary Health has changed its research focus to zero to 12-year-olds, as a majority of mental health issues have their foundation at this early age. We're here to celebrate Mental Health Month by introducing an Australian Rotary Health recipient for mental health research, Professor Marie Yap. Marie is the founder of the award-winning Parenting Strategies Program. This provides guidelines for parents to prevent and reduce the impact of mental health problems in children and adolescents. It's recognised by Expertscape as a world expert in family relations. Marie's parenting resources have been rolled out nationally in Australia and adopted in over 20 countries. She's been pretty busy. She's also authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, secured almost 30 million in competitive research funding from national and international sources. In her spare time, she co-chairs the Scientific Advisory Committee of Growing Minds Australia. This is the first clinical trials network in child and youth mental health in Australia. She was the deserved recipient of the Australian Rotary Health Knowledge Dissemination Award in 2013 and of research funding from Australian Rotary Health since 2015. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Professor Marie Yap. Thanks, Maddie. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And um, I've been at um, a few um, Rotary activities and Australian Rotary Health um, events as well. And, and I just love, um, I love the vibe that um, Rotarians bring to all of these events. So I, I'm really glad to be able to speak um, tonight. And um, unfortunately, it's, it's via Zoom, but um, um, I'm glad that the recording um, means that more people can access it as well um, offline. So, so I'm. Um, I, I hope that um, this will be an interesting session for for those of you who are able to view it. So tonight, um, as Madi introduced, um, my work is um, looking at child and youth mental health with a specific focus on how we can empower the parents and carers of children and young people for their mental health. Um, so my, my presentation is going to focus on the work that my team has done over the past um, 10 years or so. Um, and I'd like to bring you through the journey that we have been through um, and then highlight especially where Australian Rotary Health has played such a, a pivotal role um, in this journey. So in presentation tonight, I've just titled it Empowering Parents for Child and Youth Mental Health, which is really the crux of all the work that we do um, in my team. So I'll start from the very beginning. Um, so as Maddie said, I, um, I'm currently a professor. I'm a registered psychologist um, based at Monash University. Um, and I undertook my PhD um, in um, back in 2003. I, I, finished, I finished my PhD in 2007. Um, and in my PhD, I was looking at um, what we call kind of basic science research. Um, and specifically, we were looking at um, the interactions between parents and children aged around 11 or 12, so kind of grade six kind of age. Um, and we, we put them in a room, we got them to do a couple of activities and we video recorded their interactions. Um, and then we sent these um, recordings um, for what, what they call micro social 
um, coding, which means, you know, we looked at really kind of detailed nuances in the dynamics of the interaction between the parent and the child. So, for example, if the parent says something and then the child kind of reacts with a, with a frown and then how the parent responds to that and then how the child then responds to the parent's response and so on. So looking at kind of the dynamics between parent and child um, interactions, the way um, the way parents respond to their child when a child's expressing kind of anger, sadness, disappointment, fear, or happiness, and you know all kinds of natural emotions. Um, and and the purpose of my research was looking, trying to understand how the way parents interact with their children um, has implications for the child's development and their mental health and well-being. Um, so, so the research that I undertook was what we call a longitudinal study, which means that we follow the same group of um, participants over a period of time. Um, and in this instance, we followed them for um, about eight years. Um, so in my PhD research itself, I didn't do my PhD over eight years, thank God. Um, it was only focused on the what we call the baseline, so the very first um, set of um, assessments that we did, um, research assessments that we did with the, the participant group. Um, and so, so we then used that baseline um, observations to then see how, you know, parent-child interactions at age 11, 12 for the children um, prospectively predicted um, how the children developed and their mental health and well-being and their risk for mental health problems later in, in life um, as they went into um, early adulthood. So, so it, was a, it was a huge um, research project I was part of and I was very privileged to be in that we had some great findings and you know kind of very interesting insights into um, the family environment and so on. When I finished my PhD in 2007, I kind of hit a bit of a crossroad um, in my career where I, I recognized that, you know, like all the hard work that I put in to the three and a half years of doing my PhD and, and the interesting findings that we had, um, it only added kind of like a drop in the ocean of the existing research at that point in time. There's so much research even back then um, into the role of parents and how that is related to children's development and well-being. Um, but what I then realized was um, a lot of this information doesn't actually get into the hands of parents out there in the community. So, you know, parents who live the day by day in the family home, interacting with their children in ways that are really helpful for their children's kind of growth and development, and also sometimes in ways that isn't always helpful. Um, and if we're doing all this research and getting all these insights, but parents aren't actually accessing the, the research findings, then our research evidence isn't really benefiting families or children's mental health for that matter. Um, so, so that kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a light bulb moment for me where I felt like, well, if parents aren't able to access the information, then someone needs to translate it into a form that they can access it and understand it. And hopefully in that process, their children's mental health can actually benefit from the research findings. So, so that's what, you know, is known as research translation in its basic form. Um, and basically that, that kind of then took me on a turning point in my, um, in my career. So, so I started thinking really about, you know, so we've got all this research evidence, but um, how do we get into the hands of parents? And then I was kind of confronted with that um, kind of, I suppose, the devil's advocate kind of um, um, reaction where it's like, do parents really want it? Do they need it? Um, and, you know, like, would it actually benefit them? You know, do they, are they actually looking for this kind of information? So I kind of had a bit more of a think about that. So looking into parents' perspectives, um, I, I'm going to make a, a guess that, you know, um, those of you in the audience, if you aren't aunt parents um, or grandparents, I mean, or both, um, you probably would have, you know, children and young people in your life in some way or other. Um, and what we have found, you know, not just from my own research, but a lot of research already over, over the past few decades, is that um, from a parent's perspective, oftentimes um, it's so intuitive that if their child is misbehaving in some way, or, you know, something seems to be going on, you know, something not quite right. Um, the child is struggling for whatever reason. Um, it's so easy for parents to feel blamed. 
um, to feel judged, you know, to be seen as a bad parent, um, or they perceive that people see them as a bad parent. Um, in their own minds, oftentimes they are confused. They have no idea what's happening or why. Um, they're probably questioning what they might have done, what might have done wrong to contribute to the, the issues that they're facing in their family, um, and very much unsure of what to do about it. Of course, that, that leads to frustration. It leads to a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, and, you know, if they do then reach out for help, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's with that fear that they would be judged and, and blamed. Um, but um, sometimes they don't always get the help that is beneficial for them. Um, even And even if they do manage to find someone who is supportive and understanding, um, the support that they give, that they are given, might not always be the most effective or evidence-based. Um, so for example, you know, with the, you know, the um, availability of internet um, and social media nowadays, it's so easy for parents to just jump online and find information. Um, about parenting and, you know, read up about, oh, you know, why is my child behaving this way? Or why is my child showing these um, signs um, and, and get kind of advice. Um, and some of this advice is, of course, it's very credible and, you know, very um, well intended, um, but not all of them is evidence-based and, and beneficial for every parent. Um, so there's, there are risks involved in that, of course, but, you know, if parents don't know where else to go, that's what, that's what they get. Um, so, so that's that's the kind of context in which um, um, I would like to to place my um, the the rest of my talk tonight. So, kind of moving into a point here, and um, as I alluded to earlier, when a child becomes unwell, and and in this instance, of course, we're talking about mental health here. So, I'm talking about mental health challenges that the child might be experiencing. If that happens, you know, who gets the blame? who bears the burden of daily care for the child, especially if the child is very unwell, um, you know, too depressed to, to get out of bed, is not able to attend school, is disengaging from their education, is disengaging, withdrawing from their friends and, and family and so on. What who, who then has to bear the burden of trying to re-engage the child and help them to get back to daily functioning? If the child does manage to get access to treatment, we know there are huge wait lists nowadays, unfortunately. Um, who facilitates the treatment? Who's going to get the child to the appointments? Who's going to organize um, to put the child to a wait list and you know, try to bump them up the wait list to hopefully get the help that they need? Um, and of course, who's going to pay for it? Um, if a child is very unwell and they might be at risk of um, harming themselves, you know, in terms of, you know, having suicidal thoughts and, and behaviours, um, who bears the risk of harm? Who is going to ensure that the child is, is able to stay safe in a family home, which is where the child is likely to be spending most of the time with um, in if they are very unwell? And then, of course, there's, you know, what I'm calling the collateral damage, you know, as I alluded to earlier, you know, their physical health implications, um, education, um, a child is likely to drop out of school if they're very unwell, or they're going to miss out so much on their education that it's hard for them to catch up. Um, and, and of course, socially, um, you know, one of one of the common symptoms of a lot of mental disorders is, you know, the impacts on their social functioning. So the relationships that are young, young person would typically be able to have, you know, with their peers, with, with friends, um, shared interests um, and, and common activities, they're missing out on all that because of the mental illness that they're they are struggling with. So, sorry, I, I kind of um, missed that. The, the, those were just all rhetorical questions. Um, and really the answer oftentimes it's, it falls on the parents. Um, so, so I guess, you know, that kind of then leaves us with that question of, so what can parents do? What does the evidence tell us um, parents can do that will like, likely actually be effective and helpful for their children? So that kind of then took me down that journey um, of developing the Parenting Strategies Program that Marty mentioned earlier. So the first thing we did was, you know, we're, we're researchers, so we kind of looked at what the evidence actually tells us. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when we want to do, when we, when we want to know what the evidence tells us, we do what we call a systematic review or meta-analysis, where essentially we look at 
all the research that has actually already been done and published. Um, and we try to pull that all together. So we try to synthesize um, the evidence and the findings from existing research. And this is a paper that we published in quite, quite a while ago now, it's almost 10 years old. But some of the key findings that we that we gleaned from existing research um, was that there are four um, parental factors, as you call them, that increase risk in adolescents for both depression and anxiety. Um, and these include um, lower levels of parental warmth, so you know a sense of acceptance and affection that a parent might express towards the child higher levels of interparental conflict. So when, when the home environment doesn't feel safe or, or loving and um, supportive um, and, and there's exposure for the child, exposure to um, conflict, ongoing um, and unresolved conflict between their, their parents. Um, when parents are overly involved in their child's life, so in the sense of being overly protective or they're starting to intrude on their child's um, otherwise um, healthy levels of, you know, wanting to make their own decisions and um, assert their own will and, um, you know, um, make their own choices basically in life. Um, and when there are high levels of aversiveness, so this is a really broad kind of term that includes um, all forms of criticism that the parents might make, you know, kind of calling the, the kids' names, like, you know, stop being so lazy and you're such a bum and, you know, some other words that, you know, will just get censored in some instances. Um, and, and high levels of parent-child um, conflict in the home. So, you know, again, um, there's, it's common for um, parents and teenagers to have increased conflict, even in homes where um, the parent-child relationship is really, really close, um, because young people are developing greater independence as they develop through the adolescence years. Um, it's actually a very normal process, you know, where there will be an increase in conflict between parents and, and young people. But when the, the levels of conflict um, and the types of conflict and the inability to resolve these conflicts get to a point where it starts to impact on the parent-child relationship. That's where it becomes an unhealthy um, thing to, to have in, in, a, in a young person's life. So those were the, the four facts, um, parental factors we found that are um, associated with increasing uh, young people's risk for depression and anxiety. There were two additional factors we found um, that increased risk for depression specifically. Um, and, it, and that is when um, parents are not giving the young person um, as much autonomy as the, the young person should be getting for, for their um, stage of development and maturity. Um, and also when the parent is is actually unaware of what the child is doing and not even trying to um, stay tuned um, to what the child's doing when they're not with the parents, um, where they are at and who they are with. Um, so, so that's what you know um, the literature calls monitoring. So the, the important thing about all six of these factors is that um, they are identified as what we call modifiable. So, so they're not kind of, you know, very kind of fixed things like, of course, your history you know, is something you can't fix. Um, you know, parents' mental health, it's technically modifiable, but it's not something that parents um, can, can modify themselves if they are already mentally, un, uh, already have a mental illness. So it becomes harder, so they might need professional support. But with these parental factors, they are identified as factors that, you know, their day-to-day -day parenting behaviors that can actually be modified and changed um, with some support, of course, um, as required, um, but they are very much within the parent's ability to, to change and influence. But um, given the, the findings from the research, um, how do we help parents make sense of the evidence? So, for example, the, the research evidence, um, you know, it's, it's not always presented in a language or in a format that is readily accessible by parents in the general population. One example that, you know, often comes up is, you know, like I mentioned, you know, over-involvement, as we called it. Um, it's, it increases teenagers' risk of depression and anxiety. Um, but telling parents not to be all overly involved um, doesn't really help, you know, like what, when is involvement over involvement? And then it becomes even more confusing if we also tell them that um, you need to monitor your child's whereabouts, their activities, you know, who they're with and so on, um, because that's protective for your child against depression. So it'd be like, so when will I 
be monitoring them so much that I become overly involved and how do I know where to stop? So it's, it's, a, it's a huge balancing act that we expect parents to be able to make um, and oftentimes without much guidance. So what we then did was um, we conducted a Delphi study, um, which is a, a research method that um, helps us to gather the consensus of a panel of experts in whatever the topic might be. Um, and we rely on that to be the authority here. So, you know, so there's the evidence from the research, there's heaps of it. Um, but what that looks like, you know, for example, what when is involvement, when does involvement tip over into over-involvement? That's where we kind of need, you know, people with practice experience to then help us make sense of that. And that's what the Delphi study um, was um, designed to do. So what we did was we basically jumped onto Google, you know, like most, most people nowadays, typed in a few search terms um, that we think parents might type in if they're looking for some guidance on you know, what they should do um, because they're concerned about their child's mood or anxiety and so on. Um, and we found 402 unique recommendations made in the lay literature, just, just off Google. We recruited a panel of 23 experts from, from around the world um, who have research or clinical expertise in families and, and youth mental health. And out of the process of the, um, of the Delphi study, we siphoned down from 402 to 190 parenting strategies that were endorsed by the panel of 23 experts as important or essential for parents to know if they want to reduce their child's risk of depression or anxiety. So the result of that was uh, a set of guidelines, um, which we um, published in partnership with Beyond Blue um, back in 2013, using a, the same methodology, the systematic review of research evidence and a Delphi study. We also published another set of guidelines, again with Beyond Blue, um, but for parents of primary school age children. So this is the, in the age range that Maria is mentioning that ARH is focusing on now. Um, and just prior to those two, we also published a set of guidelines around alcohol, adolescent alcohol use, so parenting guidelines around that. So currently, the Parenting Strategies Program um, comprises four sets of guidelines. We um, just last year, we added a, a new set that's focusing on responding to school reluctance or refusal in a child. Um, and for those of you who are keeping up with the news might be aware um, that there was a Senate inquiry um, just, just in the past year into school refusal, which is a, a really challenging issue that has um, been magnified because of the pandemic um, and the impacts on children and young people's schooling experience with the you know, repeated lockdowns and so on over the course of two years. Um, and those disruptions have actually um, caused a significant increase in the number of children who are struggling to attend school because of um, intense emotional distress that's associated with being at school. Um, so that's that's termed school refusal or school reluctance um, in children. So so we we also developed a set of parenting guidelines um, to to provide some guidance for parents and professionals who work with these students and families. So so that's um that's the parenting strategies website and and, and the URL there. Um, all of these guidelines are freely available. So if you know anyone who might be interested or could benefit from it, do feel free to send them there. So using these guidelines, we have, um, or based on these guidelines, we have developed um, what we're calling a multi-level approach to empower parents. Um, and and I, I won't um, go into too much detail here, but essentially we, we've proposed four different levels of, of the program to support parents for their child's mental health. And the, the, the basic idea is we... Um, we're proposing that parents can get the, the form of support for their parenting um, that will be tailored, um, the, tailored to their needs and their, and their interests. Um, and by needs, we are referring to um, where the child is at on what's known as the mental health spectrum. So whether the child is um, doing quite well and kind of you know, traveling along okay with their mental health, um, all the way through to when they have clinical level difficulties. Um, so they're experiencing um, really significant um, mental illness, uh, mental health related issues. Um, and on, in the, 
in the same vein, we also look at um, where parents sit, you know, so in the bottom there, um, in terms of their confidence in their own parenting. So, so that's known as parent, parental self-efficacy um, and as well as parenting skills, you know, so um, do parents have lots of good tips and, and tricks in their in their toolbox of parenting? Would they know what to pull out, you know, when they're confronted with a specific situation um, in their parenting role? Um, so so the, the general idea is when, when parents are, um, have high levels of confidence and have lots of strategies in their own toolkit and or the child is is traveling really quite well in in their own mental health you know with you know the usual ups and downs um, of normal development um a really low intensity kind of universal type um approach like just providing them with a set of evidence-based guidelines would really be more than sufficient for these parents on the other hand, if the if the child is already really struggling with their mental health and or the parents also struggling with their own sense of confidence and, and the strategies that they have to draw on, um, we recommend parents getting a higher intensity of support where they have a fully online interactive um, program that they can access in their own time and pace um, and then supplemented with one-on-one -on -one coaching support from a trained clinician. So that's kind of where we go up to level four there. So we have tested each of these four levels in, in the research that we've conducted over the years and, and found um, that parents have really benefited um, across all the different levels. Um, and, and so because of that, we are able to then keep expanding the work that we're doing, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. So I'll just quickly walk you through, show you a glimpse of what one of our programs looks like. So parents register on the website, um, provide a bit of demographic information, and then they start filling out a survey. Um, the survey questions are tailored to the, the child's information if the parent chooses to provide that. So in this example, the child's name Claire and um, identifies as a she, her um, pronouns. And so, so the, the survey is tailored to that. Once parents have completed the survey, they get a personalized feedback report, which um, goes on to highlight you know, the key strengths that they have in that particular area of their parenting, and also are provided with specific strategies that they could also um, try and add to their toolkit, so to speak, um, to, to build um, further development in that area of their parenting. Um, they also get a copy of that that they can access um, after, after they first see it. Um, and then they're recommended specific modules of an interactive online program. Um, in this case, it's our um, Partners in Parenting program. Um, so the, um, the, there are up to nine modules in this, in this program, for example, and there's a brief synopsis that parents see, and then they can choose which modules they want to pick. Um, they will see the modules that we recommend for them based on their responses to the survey, um, where we identify there might be specific topics that they might want to get more strategies for. Um, the program is designed to be um, responsive, so, so it's, um, it can be used on a smartphone, um, so it can be used on a large screen like this, um, a smartphone um, or a tablet, you know, anywhere in between. Um, the module has kind of a variety of different, different activities with images, with um, some um, um, vignettes that they can talk, walk through, there's goal setting activities, um, there are videos that kind of um, demonstrate some of the interactions that parents and teens might have and the challenges that parents might face in those instances. Um, and then there's an end of module quiz for every single module, um, which helps consolidate some of the key messages in the program. Um, so now that we've done all this research, what next and where are we at? So some of the key next steps that we are at at the moment, um, probably one of the most exciting things in our journey to date is that Partners in Parenting, which is one of our programs, is now available at Headspace. So anyone who jumps into the Headspace national website, um, which um, um, for those of you who might not be aware, Headspace um, is the, the Youth Mental Health, um, National Youth Mental Health Foundation, and, and they oversee um, over 150 local headspace centers um, for young people to drop in and get support for their mental health and well-being. Um, they also are increasing their, their supports for family members of young people, um, and Headspace also runs the Headspace website, which has a range of different resources for young people and their families as well. So the Partners in Parenting program is now integrated into the Headspace website, 
which means that any any parent or carer of a young person who's looking for additional support and and guidance on how they can support their young person's mental health um, can access the Partners in Parenting program. So I've just put a QR code there for those of you who might be interested in looking at it. Um, another um, very exciting um, new project that we have just stepped into a couple of months ago is what we're calling PIP P2P. So it's a, a new version of the Partners in Parenting program where we have parents going through the program in their own time um, supplemented with coaching provided not by clinicians, but by peers like themselves who are parents with lived experience of caring for a young person in their own lives through similar mental health challenges. So um, in this project, we're partnering with various um, primary health networks um, and um, general practice and primary health services to look at how we can train up and develop a new workforce of peers with lived experience. Um, and then we will do a trial to evaluate this new version of our program as well. Um, and also last but not least, in terms of our next steps, um, I also wanted to highlight and kind of brings us full circle now um, to the latest Australian Rotary Health grant that my team has been very privileged to receive. Um, and that's to um, develop, um, to, to evaluate a new version of our program, um, what we're calling PIP kits um, for parents whose children have autism. Um, so we are currently finalizing the development of this program and our trial will commence early next year. So for those of you who might be interested in finding out more about the program or might not know someone who might be interested in doing the program, please feel free to email me there. So I'll just find I'll just wrap up here just by talking through again the journey that um, Australian Rotary Health has been with us on um, for for the Partners in Parenting program. So um, as Marty mentioned, I have been a privileged um, recipient of three different uh, Australian Rotary Health mental health grants um, to date, and and that's um, post the the very first Australian Rotary Health Award that I received back in 2013 for the Parenting Strategies Program. Um, so the, the first grant that we got was to fund the very first Partners in Parenting Randomized Control Trial um, back in 2015. We then got the second one um, for the kids version of Partners in Parenting um, in 2018. Um, and then just uh, late last year, we were given this new grant um, for the PIP Kids Autism Program. So where does this sit historically? So um, back in 2014, just before we got our first grant from Australian Rotary Health, we first developed the Partners in Parenting program that I just showed you. The PIP kits, the younger version, um, was then developed a couple of years after that. Um, and because of the success and the support um, from Australian Rotary Health for the Partners in Parenting program, we managed to bring PIP um, overseas to the United Kingdom. So um, we got funding from the um, National Institute for Health Research there um, to, to adapt and evaluate PIP for the UK. Um, and then in 2020, um, because again, because of the support of Australian Rotary Health and the success that we've had with Partners in Parenting, we were able to make Partners in Parenting um, program available for Australian families during the pandemic, which um, served over a thousand families during that time, which was very tricky for, for many families. Um, in 2022, we developed the um, what we call PIP Ed or PIP Education, um, which as I mentioned, um, is to address school refusal challenges that young people um, were um, experiencing, um, especially as a, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, we also know that uh, young people with depression or anxiety are at high risk for suicide and non-suicidal self-injury. Um, as a consequence, we've developed a new version of, of PIP, which is for suicide prevention, um, and that was just launched this year. As I mentioned, PIP is now available at Headspace National um, and with PIP P2P, with peer coaching to come. Um, and we are also at various stages of working with collaborators overseas um, to look at um, bringing PIP um, into their countries in its various forms and to do cross-cultural adaptations for their countries. And, and amongst those, um, we have um, at various, we're at various stages of adapting the program for um, countries as diverse as Pakistan, Canada, Malaysia, Singapore, Iran, and Sweden um, to list a few. So, so we're just really excited and really grateful for the support that Australian Rotary Health has given to our team over the years. Um, and you know, even though in dollar terms, um, some people might think it's 
not a huge grant, um, but it has made such a tremendous different, um, difference um, to the work that we were able to do, especially in the early days of our programs and of our research. And um, I'm just really pleased and really proud to be able to showcase um, where the program has been able to go because of the support from Australian Rotary Health. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you uh, for that, um, Professor. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Now, I, I noticed that we've got um, Frankston Rotary uh, also online, so they're obviously um, broadcasting this to, to their club tonight. So if you guys have any questions, I know you've got a microphone there, come and stand at the microphone or drop them in the chat and, and I'm happy to, uh, to read out the questions uh, for you. Uh, but has anyone got any questions? Can I ask a question, Marie? So, Marie, great, great presentation. Great. Uh, um, I mean, I'm I'm living with a grandson that has uh, gone through the school refusal, um, and now he's in the regret stage because um, he missed the last three years of his secondary college, and now he's looking back and saying, you know, he's missed all that, uh, you know, the with his friends and stuff like that. So, the question I have though is, what's the take up take up rate like? For the strategies and what's the feedback you're receiving from the from the program? Yeah, this is the um the school refusal program specifically. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, so we have uh, made available the parenting guidelines for school refusal, like I mentioned. Um, and since we made it available just over a year ago, we've had um almost 2,000 people download the guidelines. And this is people who download from our website directly. Um, and of course, there'll be people who might print it and then share it with others. So we, we won't be able to track those. So those are just the guidelines. Um, and then we actually ran a small trial um, because it was a PhD project. So we only had capacity to take about 15 families um, because we made available the PIP ed program, so the interactive online program, plus the clinician coaching support. Um, so we only took 14 families for that small trial. Um, when we opened it up for recruitment, we were inundated by over 100 um, um, expressions of interest within two days. Um, so we were totally overwhelmed. It has never happened in the history of our research, um, but it really highlighted how much need there was out there. Um, and because of that, we actually decided to um, create a new kind of a, a separate um, version, which is just the self-guided online program. So without the clinician support. Um, so we made that available earlier this year, which is around March. Um, and within six months, we've had over 800 families subscribe to it as well. So um, so the the online program, because we basically just open it up for free, we're, we're, we're kind of inviting people to fill out surveys three months later, but it's there's no in you know, personal contact with them. So we're, we're not expecting very high rates of response. Um, but we are seeing families do the program, um, which is which is good to see, you know, and, and really the value is that they are able to access something. Um, and um, because school refusal is um, still very much a poorly understood um, challenge in, in um, across society and internationally, actually, there's not enough research on that. Um, but the limited research um, has highlighted the important role that parents play, um, not just, you know, sadly, inadvertently maintaining some of the challenges, um, but actually the important role they, they can play in helping children to overcome it. Um, so so the, that's what the PIP Ed program is all about. And um, the coached version, like I said, the very small trial, we've had you know, overwhelmingly positive um, responses and findings from that, but it's a, such a small trial, I just won't even say that much beyond that. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, Brian. Yes, I, I just wanted to ask um, uh, my one of my daughters, who's now 50, um, had a severe mental illness in her early teens, and this would have been great for my wife and I then, but um, that's how it is. But do you have a part, did I pick up that you had a partnership with Beyond Blue, which uh, would would have makes this material available uh, yeah, for the general um... population? Yeah, so so Beyond Blue partnered with us when we first developed the guidelines. So this was back in like 2011, 2012. Uh, the guidelines were published in 2013, 2014, the first two sets. Um, we still have an ongoing relationship with them. And so, in fact, um, Beyond Blue 
used to for a few years they had what they call the healthy families website um and they used you know a significant chunk of our guidelines which they had supported the development of in their website content um and very recently like literally i think just a month ago they have launched they've relaunched their um website for families and now it's integrated into the beyond blue website and um on that beyond blue website they refer to the parenting strategies um website as well so that um people are referred to the guide that's good yeah, yeah, thank you. And by the way, thank you for your presentation. It was excellent. <clears throat> yes. All right, we've we've got a question in the in the chat here now, um, uh, and it is: How are you measuring the success of these strategies? If by strategies you're referring to the guidelines, um, we so what we have done so because these are. Kind of freely available online guidelines um the most um kind of the easiest way to to evaluate them um is unfortunately not the most rigorous way <laughs> scientifically speaking so essentially what we've done is we we just put a little pop-up window that comes up when you try to download the guidelines from the parenting strategies website um, and we ask you know whoever's wanting to download the guidelines, if they would be willing to complete a few questions. Um, and one of those questions, uh, I mean, we asked for some basic demographic information, like, you know, are you a parent or are you accessing this as a professional or where, where, which country you're based kind of thing. And then we asked them, would you be willing for us to contact you in a month's time um, just via email to ask you to, you know, let us know how you found the guidelines. So we've done that with, um, three of our sets of guidelines now. Um, and of course, as you get with these online surveys, um, the response rates aren't that great. Um, but, you know, the because we had thousands of downloads over the years for, for the first two sets of guidelines, we still managed to get a couple of hundred people respond to the one month follow-up survey. Um, and by and large, the, you know, the, the, the majority of those, um, the people who downloaded guidelines were parents. And we also had some professionals, probably about 10 to 20% who were non-parents. Um, and amongst the parents, we also asked them questions like, since downloading the guidelines, have you tried to? And then we list a, a, a range of different parenting behaviors that the guidelines cover, um, just to get a glimpse into whether they tried to make any changes in their parenting, just based on, just from reading the guidelines um, and the vast majority of parents who answered our survey um, told us that they have um, at least made some to a lot of attempt to 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 change um, in some of those parenting domains um, so that's about as good as it gets with these online surveys um, um, with the evaluation of the guidelines um, but what's important to to also acknowledge is that the online programs that I talked about, like the Partners in Parenting or PIP program, um, the content in those programs are directly drawn from the content in the guidelines. So the, the fact that we have found such clear um, benefits for families from our online programs also speak to um, the effectiveness of the strategies that are presented in the guidelines. So, so that's how we are interpreting the findings there. Thank you. And I believe Marty uh, has a question for you as well. Hi, Marie. Yeah. Can you please elaborate just a little on the grant that you received late last year and what it's going to be used for? Certainly. Very, very happy to. Um, so the, um, that's uh, for our latest version, which is for parents of children aged five to nine. Um, who have autism. So, mm -hmm. so the, the rationale for this program is, um, you know, the recognition that um, a lot of research actually explicitly exclude um, children with neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of kind of these programs, generically speaking, um, would either explicitly exclude families or um, it, with these conditions, or they would say it's not designed for it. So just, you know, kind of take it with a pinch of salt you know, kind of thing. Um, so so that's that's actually what the, the letter is is actually what we did when we when we did our first trial of PIP kits, um, the second grant that I got from Australian Rotary Health back in 2018. Um, so it was a universal program. So we didn't screen any families. We didn't exclude any family specifically. We just said um, that if your child does have a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, just to be aware that some of these strategies might not necessarily um, 
be that relevant in your family. Um, but of course, that's something that has weighed on us a lot over the years. And, and then when we did um, the work on school refusal as well, we know that children mm. um, with um, develop, neurodevelopmental disorders are also at high risk for school refusal. Um, so that's something that we've been wanting to do for a while. And, and so we were able to, to start working on that um, with one of my former PhD students who worked with me on developing PIP kits um, back in 2016. Um, she's continued to work with me as a research fellow. She's um, an educational and developmental psychologist um, by training and autism is her area of passion as well. Um, so she decided to kind of marry those two areas of passion and um, work on developing this new version of PIP kits. Um, and so now we are finalizing that, um, that that version will include an interactive online program like the original PIP Kids program with adaptations to address the, the challenges that are specifically relevant um, to autistic children and the challenges that parents um, parenting these children might face. Um, and supplementing that online program, we're also providing clinical training, clinician coaching support as well for these families and really around kind of troubleshooting and applying um, the strategies that are recommended in the online program to their family situation. So the Australian Road to Health grant um, will um, enable us to do um, what we're calling a feasibility trial um, because it's a, a more kind of clinical sample. So it's more like a clinical trial, as we call it. Um, we are unable to conduct a randomized controlled trial, which is like the gold standard um, to evaluate these interventions. Um, we're doing a single um, trial. So everyone who registers for the trial will receive the program. Um, and we're looking to recruit about 40 families over two years um, and offer them the program and then see if the program is beneficial for them. All right. So um, I'll just ask Barry to, to roll the video. Um, yeah. Governor Linda couldn't uh, be here tonight, uh, but she has pre-recorded a, uh, a short video uh, for this session. So Barry... Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful occasion of celebrating Lift the Lid, Australian Rotary Health. I'm sorry I can't be there in person this evening, but I'm certainly very passionate about Australian Rotary Health and that work that we're doing with our Rotary Clubs with mental health. To begin, we will respect and honour Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders past, present and future. We acknowledge the stories and traditions and the living culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, peoples of the land, and commit to building a brighter future together. In 1981, Ian Scott of the Rotary Club of Mornington established a fund to support research into sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. The project gained support from many Rotary Clubs and research was supported for 18 years with a breakthrough by Professor Dwyer with his work on sleeping positions of babies. It's a long history of funding research into major areas of health and lifestyle to a direction in focus on mental health from 2000. With a major sponsorship of mental health, first aid and preventing mental health problems in our communities. And currently ARH in 2023 are funding support in research aimed at improving mental health in the 0 to 12 year olds. Lift the Lid on Mental Illness is Australian Rotary Health's National Annual Fundraising Day for Mental Health Research. The Lift the Lid campaign was founded by ARH Vice Chair Greg Ross in 2016 and in Rotary Clubs just in Victoria. It was so successful that it's now across Australia. And since 1986, over 55 million has been invested in the health of all Australians. Do you know each year one in five will experience a mental health issue? So we need to create that hope in the world and fund research on preventing mental health issues and particularly in young people. So I thank you for joining us this evening and thank you for your support for Australian Rotary Health Lift the Lid. Now, as, as has been mentioned here uh, tonight, uh, Australian Rotary Health 
need your support. Um, Professor Yap has been the recipient of three Australian Rotary Health grants. The research that all of the recipients do costs money. And so how can we as Rotarians and Rotary Clubs support Australian Rotary Health? We can support Australian Rotary Health uh, by making various donations. So how do you do that? It's quite simple. Open up your favourite web browser, type in Australian Rotary Health, find the, the link that leads you directly to the ARH uh, website. And it will look something like that. Over here in the right-hand corner is what in the IT world we call the hamburger button. So it's an always easy thing to find. So find the hamburger button, click on that, and the page will refresh. If you look over to the left, you'll see support ARH. Click on donate and the Donate Now page will appear. As you can see, they've already got some predetermined uh, amounts there. If you'd like, just whack in down the bottom, select my own amount and type in however much your donation is going to be. Importantly, please enter your club name and the district in there because that makes it easy for ARH to track where the funds are coming from. If you have a specific area of that you would like your funds to go to, click the drop down box and select one of the options that are there. Scroll down a little bit further, it'll ask you to enter the credit card details and then it's going to ask you the most important question. Are you a robot? So the answer, of course, is no. So put a tick in the box, click donate. The system will process it and you'll get a receipt uh, for your donation. So I, I encourage everyone to put Australian Rotary Health through the, to their Rotary Club boards because ARH started here in our district many years ago uh, with Rotarian Ian Scott. And we have seen the great work uh, from many grants and many years of research, the, the outcomes. So please, everyone, donate to Australian Rotary Health. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, firstly, to Marie for her generosity with her time and informative PowerPoint and presentation. She's pretty busy with her full-time work committee and family. It's amazingly generous of her to give us time this evening. Could I ask, also thank past District Governor Mark Humphreys, District Governor Linda Humphreys, Barry Thomas and Daniel Thomas for their expertise and contributions this evening. Enjoy the rest of the evening, everyone. Thank you.